Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining uh, this session. Uh, named Concurrent and Asynchronous Programming, uh, State of Loom in Java 21. And this session is really about Loom uh, and about uh, um, a feature brought by uh, the Loom project called VirtusFed, which is probably one of the most exciting features uh, in this uh, Java 21 release. There are plenty of other things, but I think that VirtusFed is probably the one that is uh, um, generating the, the, the biggest attention uh, of uh, all the other people. Uh, my name is Jose. I work as a Java developer advocate at Oracle. Here is a set of links with uh, some content I like to publish on the web. We created about two years ago, a little more than two years ago, because that was the, the Java 17 release, actually, a website called dev.java along with the, the rest of the team, uh, which is the, um, I would say, the, the updated version of the, the Java documentation. The, you have a, a big set of pages, a large number of pages uh, with, with the documentation uh, of Java that, that is updated to Java, Java 17 and, uh, and 21, uh, along with also a contribution from members of the, of the community. So if you feel like uh, connecting to the website, uh, well, you can definitely do that because it's a great uh, uh, source of information uh, and docs. And also we publish uh, quite a lot of content on YouTube. Here is just a, a sample of that. Uh, you have videos, you have shorts, you have uh, many, many things. And if you're interested in Loom and the uh, reactive programming and asynchronous programming and Votos phase and all these kind of things, uh, you may be interested also in a podcast that we have called insights.java slash podcast. And there are three episodes that I just mentioned here. One of them uh, has been uh, released just a little less than a year ago about uh, uh, the NEMA engine for, uh, for Helidon, uh, which is specifically about uh, VirtusFed. Uh, you can definitely check that out because it's a very interesting um, uh, Rex, I would say feedback on uh, how Loom was used, how virtual thread were used to completely rebuild from the ground up the, the, the internal engine of, uh, of the Helidon uh, web server. Um, and it's really interesting uh, to, to listen to Thomas Langer, who is the, the project, uh, the leader of this project, to, to talk about that. All right, so let us talk about virtual threads. Uh, virtual thread is not really a new thing because the first preview was actually uh, quite a long time ago. In the, in the JDK 19. And uh, here I just uh, uh, copied a, a message from my friend uh, David uh, about the pull request uh, with the, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, with the first version of the Loom project. And as you can see, it was quite a big <laughs> stuff there. Something like, like 100,000 lines of code to be merged in the, in the JDK, in the JDK source code. So that, that was quite a, a large pull request. That has been reviewed, by the way. Maybe some of you are doing that, you know, reviewing pull requests. Well, this is this is one one good pull request to review. It took several days, of course, to do that. Uh, it's just to give you an idea of the, the the amount of code and the the engineering effort that that there is behind VirtusFed. It's actually quite huge. There are many many things in the language, not in the language precisely, but in the APIs and in the Java virtual machine that has that had to be rewritten. And we're going to see that in, uh, in the rest of this presentation. Uh, uh, Virtual Thread made it as a final feature in the JDK 21. Uh, that was uh, several uh, months ago now. Uh, it was the JEP 444 that you can read if you want to learn more about Virtual Threads. You also have links from there to, to other places. Uh, and the Loom, pre the Loom project also has, has two other features to, uh, to deliver which are uh, structured concurrency, which is still a work in progress. It was a preview feature for the JDK 21, and it's going to be also a preview feature for the JDK 22. Uh, the JEP has already been uh, integrated, uh, so it's second preview for structured concurrency. And the third feature uh, are scope values. We're going to talk briefly about scope values. It's something that is meant to replace uh, the, the, the old thread local variables uh, programming model and it's also going to be uh, a preview feature in the JDK 22. It was, it was a preview feature in the 21. The JEP as of now, as of today, is still proposed to target, but it should make it as, a, as an integrated JEP for, um, 
422 and it will be the JEP 464. Right, if you want to learn more about the Loom project, and uh, by the way, everything you want to learn is there, there is one uh, link which is jdk.java.net slash Loom. It's the, the web page of the Loom project on the, on the Open JDK um, website. So you, especially if you have feedback or if you want to, to have more information, <coughs> excuse me, you, you have, from that, that link, you have access to all the, the mailing lists that you need to connect to and that you need to, re, to read if you want to know more. Uh, as far as the adoption is concerned, uh, I would say that all the major projects, web servers, application servers, frameworks, uh, etc., cetera, uh, either are adopting virtual spheres or are at least uh, working on them and trying to evaluate what Vertoshred uh, can can bring to the, to the projects. Uh, Elidon Nima was well, on the version four was rebuilt from the ground up to uh, um, well on top of Vertoshred, and many other uh, frameworks uh, are not doing that. The other frameworks are not doing that, but they are considering at least um, using Vertoshred for for different uh, different reasons. Um, so we are going to, to deep dive in this uh, in this technology. If you have questions um, along with the talk, uh, I am monitoring the, the question tool that we have. So please just write them. Even if you just want to say hello, I'll be, be very happy also to say hello. We, we, can, we can't really see each other. It's, it's the only thing that is uh, a little frustrating with these uh, online events, but it's great to have them. Um, but if you have questions, please, by all means, don't, don't wait until the end. Uh, and if I, if I can see them and answer them, I'll gladly do that. So Loom is about fixing, fixing issues in a, in a concurrent uh, programming model uh, in Java. And I would like to start with this example, which is a very classical piece of code, kind of code that we've been writing since uh, Java 5, because executor services and future objects are a Java 5 feature. This was 2004, and that was 20 years ago, almost. And when you take a look at this code, there are actually a number of, I wouldn't say bugs, but at least issues uh, in this code. Uh, the, the first one is probably the most obvious one, is that obviously you are querying some kind of web page to read the images, read the name, it could be read links, doesn't make much, much difference. And all, all, this, all this code is a blocking code and you're writing as some kind of imperative code, so it's going to block the threads that is going to execute uh, all this. So you have a first blocking call to read the image, and that's going to block one thread, and because it's a callable that you submit to an executor service, you are going to block a thread from within this executor service, I would say happily. <laughs> and then read name is going to do the same, so that's a second thread, thread that is going to block in the executor service. Um, and then you're calling get f1.get f2.get. So you are also blocking the main thread if you're running this in the main thread. So that's the third thread that you're blocking. <laughs> so I'm going to make a package. That's one issue, but that's, that's really three issues. You are blocking three threads. And we all know that, that blocking the thread is something you absolutely want to avoid. Why do you want to avoid that? Well, maybe it's a question that we need to, to try to explore a little more because many people, <laughs> including people that I, that I work with, I say, oh, it, it's, it's back to block thread because I heard it was bad. Okay, why is it bad? Oh, it's bad because everybody's talking about it. Okay, so let us talk more about that and see what it, what it, what it is really, what, what's really happening under the hood. And so, that, so that, that's the first issue with this, with this code, but there's actually another one. <coughs> Excuse me. There's actually another one, which is, in a way it is written like that, you have you have a very sneaky bug, which is which I would call loose threads. You can you can you, you can just basically have threads that are going to continue working for you with, with this kind of code without without you even noticing it. You see, you, you there is a get get call with a timeout, which is nice. It prevents you if you if your web server is never answering, then this timeout will throw an exception after one second, so you're protected against this kind of thing. But the two get calls are actually executed in the same thread, all right? So if your, if your web server is not answering or answering in a lot of time, like hours or days, 
probably going to time out before that, but anyway. Uh, and you're calling read image. The first get will throw a timeout ex exception, but the second get will not be called. All right. It's not going to be called, so it's not going to throw any exceptions. And if your read name never gets a response, then this thread will stay occupied forever, will block forever, and you will never get it back. All right. And this is very bad because you spend some time fine tuning your executor service. You know that 16 thread is the optimal number of thread you need to have a, an application that is working nicely. And then suddenly, without any warning, without any exception whatsoever, your executor service is now working on 15 threads. And after a few hours, a few days, it will be working on 14, 13, 12, 11, etc. And after a while, you discover that because you have a degradation of your performance and you are going to reboot it. It will work again. And then after one week or two, you'll discover that actually you have loose threads in your application. Your executor service is not working with all the threads you configured which is obviously embarrassing. So that's actually the second, the second problem. It's a very sneaky one because you need to be a kind of seasoned developer to, to, to detect this kind of threat, but it's still there. It's still there. Second piece of code that I would like to focus on is this one. That's a classical request response cycle on a web server. The problem with this code is that it's a blocking code. So that's kind of a problem we already saw in the previous code. And blocking some code is bad. What is blocking here, really, it's that this get contract, which is obviously a request on some kind of web server or REST server, microservice, whatever you call that, is blocking. And during the time it blocks, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. So your, your thread scheduler is probably going to do some context switching, remove the thread from the, from the CPU, from the core of the CPU it's, uh, it's uh, working on. And then it will have to, to give you, to take you back to the CPU. And context switching is bad, it's bad because it's expensive. Right, the, the, <clears throat> the right way to write this kind of code nowadays is to use a reactive API, and it will go, give you this kind of code. This code is written using the completable future API, which is nice. There are many other APIs that are doing the same kind of thing with the same kind of programming model. And you see that the programming model is basically you take your, I'm going to go to the previous slide. You take a very simple process in three steps written in imperative code. You are going to split it in Lambda expressions. Here I have a fourth Lambda expressions because I'm handling the exception. It was not the case previously. Okay, so I have four lambda expression, and I'm going to wire these lambdas together using a reactive framework. And once this is done, my lambdas are going to be called by my reactive framework, not by my code anymore, which is a problem. What is wrong with this code is that it's not super easy to read or to write, it, but it's super hard to debug and, and next to impossible to, to profile because it's not your application that is calling your code anymore. It's really your framework. And when you want to debug something, you're basically in your framework. You're not in your code anymore. So it makes things much harder. Let us go back to this blocking issue and understand why it is bad to block, to block a thread and what is really happening. What is happening is the following. You first create your request, and that's some kind of in-memory uh, computation. Uh, in-memory computation is executed super fast in the order of the nanosecond, probably 100 nanoseconds. And then the next line is, uh, is your blocking code. It blocks your, your CPU in the sense that it uses the CPU, but without using your compu the computing power of your CPU. It's not executing any instructions on it. Why? Because the, the data launches the request on, a, on the web. It's waiting for the response. The data is not there, so it has to wait for the data to come back. And the problem is that there is a, a factor 1 million between the, the nanosecond it takes to build a request and the milliseconds it takes to, to, uh, to wait for the response. Okay, there is a factor of one million. And once the data is there, at last, after a while, after ages <laughs> at the scale of your CPU, because the scale is a nanosecond, it's pretty fast. Okay, then you have your, your, your response, then you are going to unmarshal your JSON object, your payload, whatever, and recreate your Java objects. It could be JavaScript, by the way, or any kind of other language, because that, that's, there's no Java actually here. It's all, uh, it's all computed. 
<clears throat> so problem you have absolutely everywhere. And that, that's the time, the time scale uh, of your blocking code. So if you wanted to have such a, a sketch at the right scale, okay, if you suppose that you have a thousand pixels in the width of your screen, uh, your milliseconds should really be a thousand pixel wide, and these tiny green portions at the beginning and at the end should be one thousandth of a pixel, because there's a factor one million between nanoseconds and milliseconds. And if you if you consider the the the, the the usage of your CPU when you're doing this uh, this uh, request response lifecycle, you will see that your CPU is actually not used. It's idle 99.9999, and that's that's the precise math of the time when you are processing this input-output data. And that that's the issue uh, that that reactive programming is proposing, wants to solve, aims to solve, and and is solving, of course, and that virtual thread are solving with a different model. So how can you fix that? Well, you have actually two ways of fixing this problem. That is, your CPU is idle if you are just doing one request and you want to, to do many requests, because obviously your CPU can handle much more than that. Okay. Uh, the first solution would be to create as many threads as, as you, have, you have requests, right? That, that's the old solution back in the early days of uh, Java EE, long before Jakarta EE like 25 years ago. <laughs> All right, that, that, that used to be called the one request, the one thread per request model. How many threads do you need to do that? Well, you need 1 million threads because precisely there is a factor 1 million between the time it takes to compute the request and analyze the response and the time it takes to wait for the response to, to, be, to be there. So you need to be, to, you need basically 1 million threads to have that. All right. So, I don't know if you already know that, but the, the thread class is a very old class from the JDK, and it's just a wrapper on a, on a, on a thread that is actually given to you, to the, your Java application, by your operating system. Okay, it's sometimes called a kernel thread or a platform thread, and it needs about one milliseconds to start. That's pretty standard, and in the order of the megabyte of memory uh, to store its stack. There are, there are technical reasons behind that. It like there is a an allocation of several one megabyte from one megabyte to several megabytes, because threads like to have their stack memory in a contiguous uh, in the contiguous space in memory. So you they don't want to 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 allocate first a hundred kilobytes and then another hundred kilobytes. They want they they, allo they allocate just a megabyte upfront. And the context switching we talked about that that's about a hundred microseconds to conduct this operation. So that's also quite expensive. And on a regular machine, like uh, whether it's a Linux, uh, Mac OS, or a Windows machine, you can only have several thousand uh, of threads, certainly not million. So there is a factor of thousands to be gained, actually, if you want to, to have a CPU that is, uh, that is completely used. Okay, so you can't, you can't have this kind of, you can't have this kind of, uh, this kind of thing. So if you can't, if this model one uh, request per thread or one thread per request is not working, then what do you have left? The, the, the root cause is that your, your thread is too expensive. You have a, a thread model that is too expensive memory-wise and in a certain way uh, CPU-wise uh, also. At this point you have two solutions and the first solution is the solution brought to you by asynchronous frameworks or reactive programming. Basically, you take a certain amount of platform threads, kernel threads, could be any, anywhere between 1 and uh, 10, 20, something like that. And you are going to, to send tasks, small, your small tasks that we just talked about, you are going to send them to these threads with the right framework to wire everything together. And of course, you want absolutely to avoid blocking uh, your platform thread, because if you do that, <laughs> then you're doomed, it will just... Um, uh, collapse all the performance of your application. You don't want to do that. So if you take this kind of code, uh, and this is an example I borrowed from uh, Thomas uh, Nukiewicz, who is a well-known uh, speaker and book author in uh, reactive, um, of, um, reactive programming space. So that's just some regular imperative blocking code. And you want to program it using computable future. And this is something I did. You will get this kind of pattern. And you probably can't read it, but 
I, I don't need you to read it. What I just would like to, to you to see is that it, it's a super complex way of writing things. You, you, it's just not viable to say, okay, I'm going to write an application with this kind of code. Okay, yeah. and it's not it's not the, the the problem is not that it's it's hard to read or hard to write. Once again, it's it's also hard to debug. If you consider this kind of code, you put a breakpoint somewhere, for in, for instance, in a computation of the total price, the, the the line that is just above your stack trace is the line you were executing just before before computing the total price. You know that you you just queried the card from the card service and that's it. If you're in this kind of code, this, this is something you you can't see. You can't see. You put a breakpoint. You need to put another one. I need to check. Oh, okay. Is this lambda has been called before this one in the same process? Am I really in the same process or not? You don't have access to this kind of information. So it's actually super hard to debug. It's hard to debug, but it has been working for ten years and more than that. So okay. So currently, it's a solution that is working indeed. I'm not going to say the contrary. But you also have another solution that you can uh, that, that you can. Uh, make work which is okay if the thread is to if the root cause is that the thread is too is, is too costly what about we create another model for thread that is lighter than the platform thread lighter by how much well if you have a machine on which you can launch a thousand platform thread and you need to launch actually a million one if you want to go back to this model one thread per request or one request per thread which is the same then it needs it means that your new model of thread needs to be a thousand times lighter all right so that you can have one million of them and once again this one million comes from the fact that this is the ratio between the time it takes to to create your request and analyze the response and the times you have to wait for the response to be there this thousand doesn't come from uh, from nowhere out of the blue and this is exactly what virtual thread are doing a virtual thread is a thread that is a thousand times lighter than the platform thread. So it has been implemented in Java, in the Java virtual machine and in the and in Java API. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a virtual thread class, which is not public. You cannot see it, but you can get instances of this virtual thread class through uh, factory methods. Okay. And this virtual thread class is an extension of the thread class. So everything that is true for thread, race conditions, visibility issues, locking, deadlocking, all this good concurrent programming stuff is also true for virtual threads. Your concurrent programming model is the same for thread and virtual threads. But threads are much lighter and you can have literally 1 million virtual threads on a regular machine, even a small machine like this laptop I am currently presenting on. A platform thread, uh, th these are the performance of platform, of platform thread. A virtual thread really takes about one microsecond to start, consumes in the order of the tens of, of hundreds of kilobytes, and there are optimization on the way that are going to decrease this amount of, uh, of memory they consume. And context switching does not exist for virtual thread, and we are going to see that in a minute. Loom with virtual threads is fixing one problem which is blocking a virtual thread does not block any platform thread and so it becomes much cheaper than blocking a platform thread blocking a platform thread is expensive because of context switching blocking a virtual thread does not block a platform thread so there is no context switching when you block a virtual thread this problem is fixed it also fixes the second one with structured concurrency and we're going to see that in a minute so what are the patterns you have to uh, launch virtual threads? Well, there is a factory method, uh, thread.offvirtual, that uh, build a pattern, basically. <clears throat> you also have a off-platform factory method that to, to create platform threads. You can set the name and you can start it, or you can call unstarted also with a task, runnable. And if you have an application that is built on top of uh, executor services, uh, and you want to test it with virtual thread, you have an implementation of the executor service uh, interface uh, that you can uh, create using this factory method, new virtual thread per task executor. And this executor service actually does not pull anything. There is no pool of virtual threads in it. When you submit a task to it, uh, this task is going to be executed in a virtual thread. 
directly and this virtual thread will die once this task is done. So it creates a virtual thread, a new virtual thread every time you, you create a new task. What is happening when uh, a, a virtual thread is launched, is, uh, is started? Actually, a virtual thread runs on top of a platform thread, which is taken from a, a specific for join pool, not the same for join pool as the one used for, uh, for parallel streams. It's a for join pool dedicated for virtual threads. This platform thread is sometimes called a carrier thread because it carries this, this virtual thread. And so the virtual thread is just going to be executed itself by, by, uh, by a platform thread. At some point, your virtual thread is going to call some blocking code. And here there is a, a magical object called the continuation. That's a hidden API of the JDK. So you cannot play yourself with continuation. It's forbidden. Don't try to do well. You can try to do that for a demo, but don't don't do that in your application, okay? And this when a, when a blocking call is issued, for instance in Java NIO, the Java NIO API checks if it's running in a in a virtual thread, and if it's that the case, it will call continuation.yield, and this continuation.yield will take the stack of this virtual thread, and move it, copy it, back it up in a heap memory. Thus freeing this platform thread, uh, that will be available to run another virtual thread. So remember, you may have you may have a one million virtual threads in your machine. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent of them are waiting for their data, and the rest is working. So the rest is working on these worker threads. When the data is available, uh, there is uh, the, the handler that is going to be notified, uh, and that is going to call continuation .run, uh, and this continuation.run will take the virtual thread and actually send it to the waitlist of this fork join pool. And the first worker thread uh, that, that is available will actually take this virtual thread and execute it. Each worker thread has its own waitlist, so it will go back to the waitlist it was on, from the worker thread it was on uh, previously. But if another worker thread is actually available, Fork join pool are implementing this nifty mechanism called work stealing. So this work stealing uh, can, can make this virtual thread move from one platform thread uh, to the other. So the price of blocking a virtual thread is actually the price of moving the stack of this virtual thread to the heap memory and back once the data is available. So it's not free, nothing is ever free, but it's much cheaper, <laughs> much, much cheaper than uh, blocking, uh, blocking, uh, blocking a platform thread. OK, so everything I talked about, race condition, etc., at the same, blocking a virtual thread is OK. And actually, this is what you should be doing. OK, if you're not blocking your virtual threads, then you will lose performance. All right, uh, executing a task that is not blocking, executing a task in a virtual thread is an overhead compared to executing it in a platform thread. There is an overhead because you run a virtual thread on top of a platform thread. So if you're not blocking your task, uh, then you're losing performance because you're not gaining what, what you gain when you're, when you are actually blocking, blocking it. Okay. So if you have in memory computations, do not execute them in virtual threads. Is completely useless. Don't do that. What is happening if you uh, take the perspective of the of the platform th thread or the carrier thread that is going to execute all your tasks? That's the scenario with virtual threads. You have a first piece of code that is coming that is blocking, and because it's blocking, this continuation will remove this virtual thread from the platform thread. So now the platform thread is free for, to do something else. And after a while, when the data is there, this virtual thread will come back and carry on with the execution of its code, right? But in the meantime, another virtual thread can come that will block, that will be removed by the continuation object, and that will go back sometimes later on the same platform thread. And in the meantime, another, another uh, virtual thread will come and will come back again sometimes later, and so on, okay? So from the platform thread point of view, you have virtual thread that are coming, being removed by the API, and come back when the data is there. The platform thread is never blocked, thanks to the way the APIs are working. 
Now, if you compare that with reactive programming, well, with reactive programming, exactly the same thing is happening. Okay, it's not voter thread, it's lambdas. So you have a first lambda that is coming, that is done, waiting for, the, for its data, removed from the, from the platform thread, and then brought back by the framework once the data is available. So from the platform thread perspective, everything is happening in the same way. Now you may be asking yourself, is it really interesting to use voter thread versus reactive programming if, I, if, if actually everything is executed in the same way? The performance of voter thread on reactive programming should be the same, right? Because from your platform thread perspective, everything is happening in the same way. If you observe differences of performances, they come from your frameworks and not from the API themselves. Well, you may have overheads, of course, but the main difference comes from your frameworks or from your code if you are blocking your thread by mistake in case of reactive programming. With reactive programming, not blocking a platform thread is actually the responsibility of your code. With those threads, you write blocking code, imperative code without any reactive calls, nothing. You just send this code uh, in your application and not blocking your platform thread is actually the responsibility of the APIs you're using, whether it's the, an API from the JDK, from a JDBC driver, from a framework, whatever. So you need to make sure that the APIs and the framework you're using are actually uh, supporting those threads to make sure that they are calling this continuation object uh, properly. So virtual threads are cheap to create. You can literally have a million of instances of virtual threads in, in your machine without any problem. And you should use them to run blocking code. Don't run anything else than blocking code in a virtual thread. And they, if, you, if you are calling blocking code in your virtual thread, actually you are not going to block the, the carrier thread that is executing your virtual thread thanks to the way your API, the APIs are working. Okay, it's not on you, it's on the API, which is uh, much safer, uh, obviously. So now that we have virtual thread, we are going to use a, another tool to, uh, which is really amazing, which is called structured concurrency to organize our asynchronous uh, computations. And I would like to, to start with a question, and you, may, you may, will be wondering, <laughs> why is this question relevant here? <laughs> well, it's actually super relevant. <laughs> Why did we get rid of go-to's years ago <coughs> in programming? Because go-to's can take you from anywhere in your code to anywhere else in your code. And that makes your code and your program impossible to follow because when you're looking at a line of code, you can actually come from anywhere, not necessarily from the line that is just above it. And imperative programming was designed and structured imperative program was designed with if else for while loops, etc., just to get rid of this kind of thing. Now, if you consider what you're doing in concurrent, pro in concurrent programming, you are writing this kind of code. You create a task and you run it in a virtual thread or in a platform thread. And actually, launching a task in a thread following this pattern is just like issuing a go to. If you take a look at this kind of flow of execution, when you are in this task, you look at the code in a task, where are you coming from? You don't know. And that's the problem with reactive programming, by the way. You take one of your lambda, you look at it, where are you coming from? You don't know. <coughs> is there any reason to keep using legacy thread? Of course. I mean, where is still better to use the old thread model? If you're doing in-memory computation, JIT, JIT just-in-time compilation and... Uh, and uh, sorry, the garbage collectors, for instance, are still using a platform thread as of now. So there's no reason to use uh, virtual threads for that, as long as they're not blocking, which is probably something we can talk more about later. So yes, you still need this old model for, for, for this reason. If you, if you have parallel streams, you are going to use the classical platform thread to, to run your parallel streams. You are not going to use virtual threads. So this way of launching a task in concurrent programming is actually just like issuing a go-to in your code. 
Oh, but I thought we, we could get rid of GoTo. We, I thought we had to get rid of GoTo's. Yes, we have, but actually we haven't. <laughs> we still have them. Structured concurrency is about getting rid of this GoTo. You launch a special, a special object called Structured Task Scope, and we're going to see a little more information of that. And you are going to submit tasks to it. And this object is going to execute them in Virtual Threads. It just launches Virtual Threads on demand when you submit tasks. And you can literally submit thousands of them if you want. At some point, some of your tasks are going to produce a result. And from this result, you can compute the result of your computation. But then you need to call close on this object. And actually, you don't need to do that because it's an auto-closable object. We're going to see the pattern. And calling close will kill the threads that are still running, maybe stranded, so that you don't have any more loose threads. And once this is done, you have produced the, your final result, you are going to carry on with the execution of your program. So this structured task scope object is about getting rid of this go-to-like pattern that you are using without probably realizing it when you're launching threads in an executor service or by hand. When you want to write the code, the code looks like this one. Okay, so it's a pretty easy to understand code. You just create this, this structured task scope object. It's auto-closable, so there is a try with resource here. You fork your tasks, get an object that is called that is of type subtask, T1, T2, T3. And then from these objects, you are going to compute a result and then return your result. And when you exit this piece of code, the structured task scope object will close, kill all the threads that are still running, if they are um, still running threads, and send everything to the garbage collector. And that fixes the second problem we had in the first place, remember? We had two problems. First, the blocking of the threads. This is a problem that is solved by the use of, 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 of uh, virtual threads and lose threads. And this is a problem that is solved by the use of structured concurrency. By the way, you can also extend this uh, structured task scope object with a quotation scope object, for instance, to get rid of the, the technical code that is still there and have, have a pattern that is even, uh, even cleaner. To do that, you need to uh, override one method, which is called handle complete, and that's the pattern. And as you can see, it's not really uh, uh, hard to understand this pattern. And there's a curly braces, the curly brace that is missing. So it's a buggy code, doesn't even compile, but you see that it's still simple, <laughs> even if you need to fix it. <laughs> okay, and the two methods, best quotation and the exceptions to handle your exceptions are this one. Very simple code, very clean, very easy. Even if you want to write unit tests, or even you want, if you want to use TDD to, to generate this code, to, to write this code, you can do that. It's much, much more much, much harder with uh, classical uh, reactive programming. And the last uh, topic I would like to talk to you about is the topic of scope values, which is a replacement, which is, which is meant to be a replacement of thread local variables. Now, thread local variables is a very old API, 1998. It's even before the executive service API. And there are uh, two problems, two main problems with them. The first one is that, is that they are mutable, and because they are mutable, they, they consume a, a lot of memory, actually too much memory because of that. And the second, second thing is that they actually share the life cycle of the thread they have been declared on. So before executor services, you create a thread, you add your thread local variables in them, and then you, the thread is gone. You, 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 you kill it and you create another one. So the life cycle of this thread may be short in your application. With executor services, now the life cycle of your threads are the same as the life cycle of, of your application. So if you forget, for instance, to call your remove method on the thread local variable that you create yourself, then you're doomed because you have a, a safety, a security issue, a security gap in your application if you, still, if you forget to do that. So first, thread local variables are supported by virtual threads. So if you have an application that is using that, and you want to test it with virtual thread, it should work out of the box. If it doesn't, then you need to report the bug or at, uh, to the JDK team. The scope value programming model is the following. You create a scope value instance with this uh, factory method. <coughs> and you should put it in a place where everybody can see it, some kind of global variable. 
And then you are going to bind the disk scope value to a value, or maybe a value to the disk scope value, sorry, and run a runnable or a callable in the context of this scope value. And this binding can be seen from this method call, do something smart, and not outside. So the, the scope of this scope value of this binding is actually bound to this method call. It's not bound to any thread, okay? Everything is happening in the same thread here. If you want to distribute it among several, uh, several method calls, you can also do that by chaining this, uh, this runnable call. In inside this runnable, you can check if the, the key is bound. And if it's the case, get the value with, with the get method. And if it's not, uh, do, do something else. The principle of scope values is that you do not want to have loose scope values as you may have loose thread local variables if you forget to call remove on them. So if your method, if your runnable is creating threads, platform or voter threads, then the bindings are not transmitted to these threads because it's a go-to and because this method can return and the thread is still running. So the thread really escapes the scope of this method call. But if you, because structured task scope are bound because you have a closed method that you're going to call at the end of the day, they are transmitted to the voter threads created within structured task scope. So you see that this binding and this limitation of the scope of everything, whether it's voter thread and scope values, that's really a key design principle in these two APIs, structured concurrency and scope values. And that's the reason why you can only transmit the binding within a structured task scope. And uh, we are almost at the end of this presentation. So this is what I wanted to talk to you about the Loom project. I hope you liked it. And uh, in case you have time for question, we have uh, two minutes left. So Loom is great. It's here. You can play with it. And you will be able to play even more when you have 22 and 23 and structured concurrency and uh, score values. I don't know if you have any questions. It's, if it's the case, please. Uh, you can use the, the chat window to do that. <clears throat> I saw the question about the legacy uh, thread model, and I already answered it. I think so. So if it's not the case, thank you for asking it again. And if we don't have any more questions, thank you all for your attention. I hope you had fun. I know I did. <laughs> and I hope you'll be able to uh, write great code using uh, Loom, Voto Thread, and Switchhead Concurrency. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.